Hey everybody, welcome to Sirens and Stethoscopes. I'm your host, Kevin. Today we're talking about antibiotics and trauma and reducing our infection rates in those patients. So let's dive into it and get started. All right, so today we're talking about trauma, carrying the risk of infection. And with me, I have Josh Taylor that we'll get to meet in a minute. And we're going to talk about the opportunities we have to reduce the risk of infection, which then goes to better outcomes, better recoveries, and so on in our trauma patients. So, Josh, thanks for joining us today. No, thanks for having me. Why don't you give us a little bit of introduction to you, who you are, and, yeah. and where you're coming from here. Definitely. Um, so, I'm Josh Taylor, uh, the Assistant Chief of EMS over at Community Volunteer Fire Department. Um, I started with the Houston Fire Department, uh, currently still work there. Um, I've been there for 12 years now, and I've been with Community for eight years. Um, so graduated the fire Academy in 2010, uh, started with Houston fire department right away. Uh, worked from the rank of firefighter. I'm also a, a captain there right now was on the paramedic unit for 10 years out there, uh, in a leaf. Um, so pretty heavy call volume, uh, then transitioned to the suppression side. Um, so 12 years of Houston, um, with community, I started off as a paramedic, worked my ranks up to supervisor, then captain of EMS, and then to chief of EMS for the past two years. Nice. Excellent. Well, thanks for joining us here. Um, we, we picked this topic just for you. Yeah, thank you. Being being a fun trauma topic. Antibiotics and trauma is, uh, what, a couple couple years old now? Maybe three, four, five? Pretty newish. Yeah. So a, a newer thing. Yeah. And really where we saw it was open fractures, compound mm-hmm. fractures, uh, because of the infection rates that come with these patients through the trauma center. And... As with a lot of good projects that we see in EMS, there's a problem that gets identified through process improvement in the hospital. We try to improve pieces of the process. And one of my favorite things is picking out what we can take of that process in the hospital and put it into the field. And here we see antibiotics. Definitely. And I think this is one of our challenging ones because it's it's kind of an abstract thing for us in the field. We don't see the benefit. Uh, this is a lot like the steroids in respiratory cases that we don't get to see an immediate response but the impact is profound and the benefit to outcomes is is tremendous, right? No, 100%. It's something we don't think about all the time. Like you said, it's something that we don't see the immediate effects on. Um, we do such a great job um, training our guys for immediate bleeding control, airway, training that temp- tension in with thorax and hypothermia. Um, we get them all packaged up. We get them to the hospital. We forget about these nasty open wounds. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's so much we can do for these patients. I guess yeah. forgotten. And it's still a controversial subject, so not a lot of people are wanting to push it, but it's something that's very needed in pre-hospital EMS. I agree, especially as even with the uh, quick transports to trauma centers, yeah. we, we get some of that too, that it's uh, these time frames aren't really that long. And one of our adages here is that the back doors of the hospital are not treatment. Right. And that's not when the clock stops. Right. That, that transfer of patient care, um, even the trauma center being spun up and lots of good staff receiving mm-hmm. this patient, they're going to do their assessment. They're going to recalibrate to the yeah. patient situation and the presentation. Draw labs. It, it's, and, it's not yeah. a true take the ball and run. Yeah. I mean, they take a couple of steps back to make sure things haven't changed from their initial impression. Right. Thing. So, uh, so time frames are important, even with short transport times, close hospitals and what it may be. And, um, man, what, what an opportunity though. Definitely. I think it's an Definitely. opportunity. I thought of a point. I can't remember the point. I'll remember it sometime randomly as we talk. But <laughs> so let's talk about fractures then. That, that's where this started with right. fractures. And there's my point before we get into it. We do all these things, life saving interventions, and you're right, we don't think about antibiotics. I would think we even start thinking about pain management then because we get somebody screaming, whatever right. it may be. And maybe there'll be a touchy comment to make for some people, but like pain doesn't kill people. Right, right. Uh, people, yeah. Uh, yes, like make people comfortable. Let's take good care of them. But pain's not the killer. Like something else causing the pain is the killer, and infection's a killer. Right. What's best long term for these patients? Yeah, I'm not saying don't manage pain. Like right. please manage pain, but again, now we're getting into this second echelon of interventions beyond the inter- immediate life threatening care. Definitely. All right, fractures. Why fractures? Why do why do we get infections and fractures? Uh, I mean, it's pretty obvious. They're they're dirty. They're big. Um, all these fractures, especially femur, legs, tip fib, they're very big, open, dirty fractures. 
Um, that bone breaking causes such trauma to the whole body that it's a gaping open wound. Um, and what we're not in the cleanest environment, right? These houses we go to, these apartments, these assisted living facilities, they're not the, the cleanest, most sanitary places. It's not like a hospital. The roadway. The roadway, um, dirt. Um, we don't think about it all the time, but we're packaging these patients up, putting them on the C-spine backboard. Um, did we clean that backboard really good this morning? Probably not. Mm -hmm. um, is there dirt in the roadway that we're at? Is there gravel? What's getting into these wounds? Were they rolling around on the ground before we got there? Um, so we need to just assume that these wounds are contaminated, dirty, and that they need antibiotics. Well, let's uh, remember that bacteria just lives on the skin. Yeah. Like the local flora just lives there. So yeah. breaking the skin in any way introduces the bacteria. I find it really interesting with, with these compound fractures. Mm -hmm. That much trauma is just going to kill cells. Tissues right. start to die. And that's where this bacteria adheres. And that's what makes them so challenging is they attach to the dying dead tissues that are all throughout the limb right. because of the amount of trauma and, and make this nice little infectious jelly. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's it's such a a deep injury that it just goes right down to to the bone. Uh, yeah. Right. It gets down deep in there and there's an awful lot of tissue involved. And you can't see it. Yeah. So it's stuff that's going on that you don't see physically in front of you. But you have in the back of your mind that this is something that's going on with these patients, something that I need to treat. Mm -hmm. um, it's part of that life threatening uh, kind of work of our work operations we need to go through. We need to add that to the end of a March assessment or end of a bath assessment. We need to get that on there. Yeah. I like looking at this uh, like surgery, right? There's an awful lot of prep to right. prevent. Uh, infection and right. contamination in surgery, we, we don't get that time. Like mm. The prep time is gone, but the body has been punctured. And uh, so all the things that we're worried about that get so much time and attention to prepare for surgery, it should kind of legitimize our concern for contamination and infection in my mind. Yes. Are all fractures the same? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, you can... Obviously, breaking into two broad categories, you have major fractures and minor fractures. Um, minor fractures probably have a less infection rate than major fractures do, just based on the things we talked about. Uh, less traumatic of an injury, uh, maybe it wasn't as serious. Um, the bone's smaller, less of a break. Um, obviously, less surface area that the infection traveled into. Um, but in my personal opinion, any kind of fracture or open injury should receive some sort of antibiotic, no matter how major or minor it is. I agree with that. There's fracture grading, right? Right. Uh, we're not going to grade fractures in the field. Like, right. Don't worry. Guys. <laughs> we're not going to grade fractures in the field. I agree with you. A bone's coming through the skin. That really is a good general category for us that, yes, yeah. it came through the skin. We're going to treat it and try and prevent infection. Uh, statistically speaking, these higher grade fractures carry that higher infection rate. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is just me making some inferences. I put that to the amount of energy that has to go into a fracture, uh, right? So if we have a radius or an ulna broken, right. we're dealing with smaller bones than femur. Yes. Take a lot more energy to break a femur. And maybe I'm just being creative and imaginative, but I, in my mind, take this as energies carrying these germs in. I like that. With yeah. Let's go so look at it. Correlation is not causation, yeah. but there is a good relationship between the amount of energy that went into this fracture, the grade of fracture, and yeah. the risk of infection. Um, when it comes to early antibiotics in our lower grade fractures, I agree there's a place for them, and we're going to keep doing it. It sounds like you're going to keep doing it. Uh, the The benefit that shows up in the statistics just isn't yeah. strong compared right. to these big femur fractures that we make a profound impact. But again, we're not going to grade in the field, so we're going to go all. Yeah, 100%. Um, what about close fractures? Um, I mean, that might be an obvious thing, but obviously there's no open wound. Um, mm -hmm. We still need to address that bath assessment, that march assessment. Even if it's a closed fracture, there's probably still internal bleeding. Mm -hmm. um, that's something that we've had to harp on before. It's like, hey, there's leg swelling. Why is this leg swelling? They're probably bleeding internally. Let's get that tourniquet on and, mm -hmm. and stop that bleeding internally. But as long as there's not an open wound, then we don't need to have a need for antibiotics. I agree. We, we kind of lose things. Yeah. Right. Right. So very obvious but let's we'll just go yeah. and throw it out there right yeah, some of us not need necessarily need to spell it out yeah, for them so those i'm talking about me over here <laughs> right uh and a lot of these closed fractures are going to be surgical cases yes but we get the opportunity well we uh, we the surgical team gets the opportunity to better prep right to prevent that contamination so 
Right. This isn't just a fractures, all fractures. We're talking about compound, open yes. fractures, especially the dirty look fractures, open fractures. But only fractures, or do we have some other opportunities in front of us here? Uh, I mean, there's definitely other opportunities. Uh, one big example is gunshot wounds. Mm-hmm. Um, not necessarily the same. Depends on the caliber of weapon and everything, but there's still a penetrating outside source that's coming to the body, causing potential infection. Mm-hmm. Um, so obviously bigger gunshot wounds, more gunshot wounds, higher uh, possibility of infection. Uh, maybe that small little caliber that just nicked him a little bit. Eh, that's that's a kind of personal call. That's judgment mm-hmm. call at that point. But if there's a patient that had multiple gunshot wounds laying on the ground, on the street, in a dirty house, in a unsterile environment, then I would go ahead and give um, an antibiotic with that. Yeah. And I think that, that goes to our energy transfer. Yeah, on this exactly. Floor too, right? I mean, even these small caliber firearms, that's some pretty good yeah. energy coming Definitely. through. Um, but you're right. You get your large caliber yeah. hand cannon kind of weapons yeah. that are making bigger holes and transferring a lot of good energy through. Um, and you're right. I mean, you don't really typically get into gunfights in clean environments. <laughs> no, no. I sometimes, mean, yeah. Sometimes, I Never guess. Enough. Yeah, I guess. I think it's safe to say any kind of open trauma needs an antibiotic. Yeah. I think that's set. That's the best way to approach it. I think I think it's pretty you good. You can't get in trouble for doing it. That's the best part. Because they don't work for you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, sure, like, I, I don't know. I agree. Yeah. If, we're, if we're puncturing the skin, we need to be worried about that risk of infection. Right. And uh, we can get into a lot of the infection rates and all the statistics behind it. Really, it's, it's depriving an opportunity. Yes. Anytime the skin breaks, there's an opportunity for infection, and we're just depriving the opportunity for the yep. bacteria to, to get in there. Uh, like I said, if, if we start adhering to this dying tissue, it gets harder. The longer it's there, the harder it is to get out of there. Exactly. And that's the benefit of this time-sensitive intervention. Uh, because we see, we don't see, as medicine, we see the benefit coming from shorter hospital stays. Yeah. Um, people are recovering faster. We can we can yep. close up wounds if we've... Less time it, in the ICU. It's it, just right, so it, many benefits. And open wound's going to get debrided. Yeah. Because of this dead tissue, the bacteria yep. is adhering to it. we got to clean it out. Um, So they can close up this wound sooner. Right. If we've helped prevent bacteria from taking hold. So rehabilitation can start happening mm-hmm. faster, get out of the ICU faster, get out of the yep. hospital faster. Bills are down. And yep. right, the financial impact, we know the risk of infection is much higher just being in the hospital. That's where sick 100%. people are. Yep. So we we see such great impact. We're talking about like days. Like there's oh, some good numbers that say days come off of recovery yeah. being in the hospital. Yeah. Um, I was, of course, researching before I got here mm-hmm. to get, get up with the study, but- uh, publication by the Air Medical Journal, they put out something that says, on average, pre-hospital antibiotics are given in a 30-minute average before they get to the ER. Like mm-hmm. That's the time difference is 30 minutes. With that 30 minutes, there's a 40.3 infection reduction rate with that. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's 40% is pretty, pretty, that's large. That's a pretty good uh, one. That's, that makes me want to give antibiotics to any kind of patient like this. That's, mm-hmm. that's the reason. And I, I think we very much so have a 30 minute window. Yeah. Like we can do our, our drive downtown, mm-hmm. uh, very easily 20 to 30 minute window of time that we can give that. Drive downtown, time from life flight to land and give it mm-hmm. by the time they get to the OR. And like you said earlier, the doctors have to go through their check boxes again. They have to draw labs. Um, it's, it could be right. hours. We, we've all you know? been there with, with regardless of how high acuity this case is, there's yeah. still administrative processes at the hospital that need to happen and patients need to be in the systems. Yes. Certain, certain medications can get pulled. Yes. So even if somebody wants antibiotics loaded on this patient as they walk through the door, uh, there's some things that need to happen before we get there. And these are just time delays. And that's yeah. just the nature of the business. We don't have to deal with as much of that. So don't don't miss an opportunity exactly to load them up. Uh, uh, what antibiotics are we talking about here? Uh, I mean, we primarily give ANSEF okay. uh, community. Um, we also give cefepime. Um, okay. I don't know how familiar everyone was with that, but it's also same kind of uh, class of antibiotic. Mm-hmm. Um, so with open femur fractures, open long bone fractures, we give cefepime mm-hmm. as compared to ANSEF. Um, reason for that is it has a higher deep bacterializing factor. Um, it's just a more broad uh, antibiotic than mm-hmm. ANSEF is. Um, so with those smaller wounds like um, radial and uh, just very minor ones, gunshot wounds, we'll give ANSEF. Um, if it's something really large and dirty, we'll give cefepime too. Interesting. Um, same concept, um, yeah. same dosage amount. Uh, we'll drip it in a bag over uh, 10 minutes in a 100cc bag, um, but it's two grams, just like ANSEF is. 
and uh, has great effects. Nice. So we got we carry ANSEF here. We we yep. use our ANSEF, right? Um, cephalosporin comes out of the penicillin family. Yep. Not a direct derivative of penicillin, but we're worried about penicillin allergies a little bit. And you're saying cefepine the same class of drugs. Same class. Cephalos- same, same watch out. Ask allergies. Of course, most people are probably going to say they have a penicillin allergy, but do they really? According to the CDC, <laughs> uh, we got about 10% of people yeah. will talk about it, penicillin allergy, right. but it's still only a 1% of that 10%. I feel like when you ask them it really has it. what happens if you take penicillin, they say, oh, I, I don't know. When I, was, when mm-hmm. I was a kid, they told me that I was allergic to it. Right. And that's all they know. So, I mean, I have uh, sulfa on my list. Yeah. But, like, I swell up. Like, I took it. We can try I, some after. Yeah, we'll try it after this. Cool. Yeah. Let's yeah. see what happens. Yeah. Sure. Why not? Right? What could go yeah. wrong? Yeah. Uh, right. So, so really, because we're talking about probably reduced GCS patients. Right. With this. Uh, right. Not a lot of opportunity to get mm-hmm. the full medical history and the list of allergies. And uh, we don't get to check that box. Right. But the point here is that the risk is, is really lower than we'd like to think. 100%. Yes. Does an allergic reaction to an antibiotic look any different than other allergic reactions? Absolutely not. Right. We have all the same things to treat it. So we're worst case scenario. scenario, something happens, we got a whole lot of meds in the back to fix that too. Right. And we'll do it. Yeah. Benadryl's going to take care of it. We're going to do epis we need to to support it. Like, we're there to fix it. Don't be scared of it. There to fix we it. We got it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, spoiler alert, as we start talking about getting into whole blood later on. There's transfusion reactions in whole blood, exactly. which are a thing, very rare, right? But the same kind of thing. It's it's the immune system responding to a foreign item. It does exactly. Like. Okay, so we take care of it the same way we do allergic reactions. Yeah, no big deal. Ain't so scary. No, it's, there to fix it. Saving lives yeah. is fun. So talk about yeah, so Talk about. So how long have you been using cefepine in trauma? That's pretty pretty new. Okay. Um, so we brought it on with our sepsis protocol. Mm-hmm. So we have a pretty new sepsis protocol at community. Um, and we introduced cefepime into that. Um, I'd say maybe three, four months ago, we added it to the trauma, um, just from talking to doctor, different doctors in the Herman system and, uh, different colleagues of our medical director, they kind of recommended that maybe for these dirtier wounds, these bigger wounds to switch to cefepime just cause it has that better, a better factor. But, um, as long as we're getting an antibiotic, that's the main thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, with our sepsis protocol, which we had about a year now, um, we brought cefepime on. It's worked wonders. Uh, a lot of pushback from the ERs. And, mm-hmm. well, you did, just didn't draw blood beforehand. You don't know if they actually have an infection. We're taking the risk. We're helping these people. If they did have an infection, I'd much rather give that cefepime than, oh, we gave it. They didn't really need it. There was an infection. It's. You know, I heard a comment that I really like that it is we got to start, got to get blood pressures before the antibiotic. Right. Uh, the infection still lives, like exactly. it's still there. Exactly. Like you give antibiotics, and thirty minutes later, it's like it's still there. Yeah, I mean, come on, right? Uh, hey, doctor's going to doctor, right? Exactly. So they can do their thing. We'll get there, and a uh, nice little teaser for a whole other conversation of another day that we can dive down antibiotic therapy and, and deep into that. Yep. Uh, because a good thing to know about antibiotics is they're not all created the same. Exactly. But there are different classes of antibiotics. Mm-hmm. Some are more effective in different systems of the body. Yep. And really, that's the the blood culture discussion is yeah. what is the specific gram staining, all we get into the immunology of it to make a targeted attack yeah. on it. So we talk about ANSEF, we talk about um, cefepime, we even talk about like clindamycin. Like, yeah. They're all broad. Like They make a, a, a nice shotgun approach at knocking down some germs, and then this patient will get a more targeted antibiotic exactly. course. Yeah. Like you said, we don't have the time in the back of the ambulance to do all this. No. We don't have time for cultures. We don't have time to check labs. We don't we don't have time for that. We're trying to treat these sick, sick patients. Mm-hmm. And 99% of the people we're giving these antibiotics to are these sick, sick, dying patients that mm-hmm. need help. So I'd much rather throw the kitchen sink at them in the beginning. And if we didn't need it, we didn't need it. But it's not causing harm. I like it. I agree. Because how, how much of a kick in the pants is it when we do all this amazing yep. care to bring somebody from the brink of bleeding out, exactly, just to have them die in the ICU four days later, it's frustrating from systemic infection, it's very frustrating, right? Just, uh, gosh, like what a, what a kick, right? Yeah, and we can prevent it now. And this is just a good highlight. Like I said, more of these things are going to come to the field. Mm-hmm. This, as simple as a medication in the field, makes such profound impact on the back end. We're better to have it, but the field. You cut yep. 30, 45 minutes off of time. And y'all have heard me preach about time to intervention, that that's that's our key of things, not time to the back door, not time to the ambulance, time to intervention. 
And this is, I mean, there's just another highlighted case of it. Exactly. If we have time to play around with stuff and we have this patient somewhat stable, take that extra three, four minutes to give that ambotic. Mm -hmm. If a life flight arrives on your scene and you haven't given that ambotic yet, be like, hey guys, can you hold on a second? I want to push some ANSEF. They will completely understand. They're not trying to rush that patient out right away. They're, they will let you do those interventions. So just, if there's any opportunity, take that small amount of time to be like, hey, what am I missing when I'm pulling up to the hospital? Oh, I forgot ANSEF. Let me well, you get put it. that in real quick. Cool. It's better than not doing it. Oh, that's, good. that's good encouragement. And I guess just from a safety point, give it a dedicated line. Yes. Like don't, don't start pushing other medications through the line that is running in the antibiotic. Definitely. And with these patients, they're, you should probably get two points of access anyways. Absolutely. Yeah, I would, I would agree. Yeah, you guys go IO for the first kind of line of defense for... We got to get the clinical judgment up right. if, if, if right, we're going for the time. So right. Don't spend 10 minutes looking yeah. for an IV. I mean, yeah. all this stuff. Yeah. So we don't have a hard and fast of it's got to be this one on the first. Right, yeah. yeah. Again, it's... If you see an obvious IV, go for it. But yeah, our, our objective is that rapid access. Mm -hmm. You can do it that way. You can do it this way. Yeah, I'm a big fan of just getting two quick humeral head IOs. Mm -hmm. And then you have two points of access, one for blood, one for pushing your medication, and you're set. Y'all hear humeral head IO. Humeral head, please. Humeral. Please, please. Well, Josh, this is very enlightening. I appreciate this kind of oh, conversation yeah. and interaction. Uh, any other thoughts you want to close with? Anything you didn't get to talk about today? Um, no, not much. No, I appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I think the main takeaway from this is, yes, antibiotics are important, but don't let that interrupt your al al algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, whether it be March or Bath or whatever you guys use, go through all those first because that's the stuff that's going to kill these patients immediately mm -hmm. don't get to the r in march and be like oh i forgot about it. let me go back and push this no go through everything check those lung sounds um get blood started get all that stuff started txa get all your good stuff on and then come back to antibiotics for a kind of finishing closing touch on it nice yeah i like it man well thanks josh awesome i appreciate, no, I appreciate it. it thanks for having me appreciate y'all tuning in thanks for joining us for our new podcast here and we'll catch you for the next one Thank you.